My name is Hanna Stoltenberg. Uh, I'm a writer and I've written a text inspired by uh, the painting Woman by the Veranda Steps by Edvard Munch. One of the first things that struck me when I saw the painting for the first time was how modern it looked. Um, so very early I decided to place my text in the current times or even some years ahead. The second thing was uh, a story from the news from a couple of years ago about a human rights lawyer called David Buckle who uh, set himself on fire in Prospect Park to protest environmental destruction. And that's uh, a news story that stuck with me for quite some time after I read it for the first time. So for some reason when I saw, the, um, saw this painting, the story came back and uh, became a part of my text. How it burns. A woman is living alone in a house. The house sits all by itself on a grassy hill. Ten days have passed since she moved in. She doesn't have her laptop, but every morning at seven, her phone announces the arrival of the day's astrological forecast. She reads her horoscope in bed. Afterwards, she reads the news. The stars tell her that Saturn's unusual position in the sky is making her susceptible to dark and unfortunate impulses. A human rights lawyer has set himself on fire in protest against ecocide. There were no witnesses, it says, no images. His body was found on a plateau inside a ring of refined compost. A jogger saw the smoke from a distance and called the police to report a forest fire. The landscape is not as expected. The trees grow taller and closer together, so does the grass, and it is muddy, disfigured, she thinks, and simultaneously realizes that the word stems from the news. From the southern veranda, she has a view of a heart-shaped lake, which on overcast days seems both dull and bottomless. She pictures herself swimming in it, long, naked strokes, but it's already too late. Maybe next summer, if she's still here. She's borrowing the house from a man who knows her sister. When the man handed over the keys, he commented on the strange times, dutifully, but also with candid fear in his eyes, and told her to make herself at home. He hesitated for a moment on the threshold. Then he drove across the border to another house where his family was waiting. As far as she knows, he will be gone for a long time. He hasn't said this in so many words, but her sister can take a hint. Her sister is flexible. It's one of her most highly esteemed qualities. She adapts without questions, and some, like the women in the house, would call her strategic, without knowing whether this is a bad thing. The woman says to her sister that she wants to learn the names of trees, she wants to be able to distinguish maple from ash from pine. It struck me that I should know what I am surrounded by. Her sister sees through her. Do you know what the phone you're talking into is made of? She asks. How your clothes are made? Can you explain to me what the internet is? In the morning, she puts on a gray printed t-shirt, blue cotton trousers and a kimono jacket that doesn't belong to her. She found it on a hook behind the bedroom door. She makes a cup of instant coffee and sits down on one of the chairs on the veranda. It's almost too cold. Usually what she reads passes through her like a ghost, but today she writes the word self-immolation in the search fields and reads about Tibetan monks on Wikipedia. Before he doused himself with gasoline, the human rights lawyer sent a letter to his family and the media by email. My early death by fossil fuel reflects what we are doing to ourselves, the letter read. As an attorney, I have worked eight years for others' freedom from poverty and 13 years for others' freedom from discrimination. But work for freedom fails as we slowly turn Earth into a prison. He believed in things like being mindful, right actions, thoughts and speech, his family tells the newspaper. When he washed vegetables, he saved the water to use in his garden. She 
save screenshots of the letter to her phone. As time passes, more routines emerge. She exercises like an inmate, push-ups, knee bends, sit-ups. Her desire for others is vague and sporadic, yet the hope lives inside her that having a good body will mean something in the future. When the sun shines through the living room windows, she walks around naked. She takes pictures of herself in the mirror, standing up straight and on all fours. She shares them on social media, the light falling nicely and the image cropped just above her breasts. Be careful, her mother used to say. Everything you post on the internet will be there forever. She finds a certain satisfaction in the knowledge that her mother was wrong. That everything is like everything else, disintegrating. Her sister calls and talks about the man who owns the house. He's a very generous man, she says. That's not true of most men. Others would have wanted something in return. It's unusual to hear her sister say something negative about men. Previously, she has made it clear that she prefers their company. Before things got as bad as they got and superficial conversations were still possible without guilt, her sister referred to biology and life on the savanna all the time in discussions about politics and social structures. She said the day civilization breaks down, it will be men who protect us, survival of the fittest and so on. It's hard to say whether she believes the day has come or if borrowing a house from a man is the same as being protected by him. When do you think this will be over? She asks. Over, over or just over? Her sister says. I don't know, I can't think that far ahead. Where you are now, her sister says, you are farther away from everything than almost everyone else. And maybe it's true, but how can she know exactly how alone she is when she doesn't see anyone but herself? All her life, she has lived in cities, one after the other. She had a job selling things online, but nobody buys the kind of trash she sold any longer. Back then, she liked living close to strangers, feeling their thighs brush against hers on overcrowded metro cars, having her wrists massaged with lukewarm lotion by the manicurist she visited weekly. She never looked at anyone and thought, it's them or me, at least not in the way people started doing before she left. At the same time, everything she didn't think, didn't see, could still have been true. Afternoons are difficult, She's like a blonde in a black and white movie, limp and terrified, uncertain as to whether she's headed towards something or away from it. In the city, she had remedies, TV series. Here, she walks around the house in circles and peels paint off, off the walls. She wonders how many people still have phone coverage and when the news and the horoscopes will disappear. She remembers a film about a group of siblings who thought their back garden was the whole world because that was what they were told. There are leaves on the ground. Everything is dry and clear and still. She stops in the low evening light, which adds color to everything and connects with the moment, the seasons, something magnificent. The ivy climbing up the wall of the house will soon cover the windows of the first and second floors, so you will no longer be able to look out of them. The leaves are fiery red and consume the green more quickly than meets the eye, as if it is actually burning. Is it ivy? She doesn't know. She's afraid if she calls things by the wrong name, that the right names for the real things will rush past her in a parallel lane to which others have access. What does she mean by right? The ground is cold and she's still thinking about the human rights lawyer, alone on the plateau in the thin light just before sunrise, enveloped in flames. She will start small. She will learn the name of trees. The grass where he was found had been scorched in an almost perfect circle. The police didn't understand why until they found the black bin bag he had used to carry the refined compost from his garden, which he scattered around himself. The new soil prevented the fire from spreading. <laughs>